can hear you. I want to stand in the sun. Yeah, you can. Yeah, I just wanted people directing my way. So you can stand in the sun if you want. I know it's more comfortable over there. Thank you for joining us. Um, so uh, it was about 2015 when we changed and sort of uh, in, and did the gardens here in the front yard. Uh, there was no fence or anything. And for those of you that are a little familiar with uh, agriscaping, how many of you are familiar with the garden planner? Okay, so a few. The garden planner, it's an app uh, that you, it's, I think it's about $80 for two years of it. And that's what I use to design the whole garden and lay all this stuff out. And basically, once you sign in and you pay for the app, then what you end up doing is you'll put in your address and it will, uh, everything will be specific for your area, not like zones, but s specific for your address. So all of the planting calendars, the suggestion for trees, all of those are going to be things that you can actually grow at that address. Now, uh, once you've done that, then I learned a little bit the hard way. I've got a long, narrow front yard here, so I measured the whole thing out and uh, the width and the length. And the only problem with that was I'd have to scroll down for miles to get to the other side. Uh, so it was better to do it in smaller blocks and to do that. So the first thing I did is I put in, I had a, a couple of citrus trees that we put in. Uh, this here tree and some of these oranges, I've got this one and three more. There's two on the side and then one over in the back. I believe these were here before the house was built. The house was built in 1948. Uh, when we moved in in 94, the guy next door, he was the original owner at the time. So I got to know a little bit of the history directly from a person that lived through that. And his name was Henry. And uh, Henry told me that the builder built this house. Him and his family lived here and they used it as a model home. And also I learned that there's a Costco down here just a little south of us. Just south of that Costco, there's a big city park there. It's called Pierce Park. And uh, that park is named after the family that owned all of this land. The Pierce family owned all the land from 56th Street to 40th Street, from Camelback to McDowell. And it was all citrus, uh, date palms, and pecans. And uh, so those things I put in the landscape just drop those in because then it will create those microclimates and the shading and then this tree over here is a Mexican key lime we put in around 2015 it's a 15 gallon plant uh, like the plants up front in those size and then we have the moringa here how many of you are familiar with moringa a little bit well, a lot of Botanists and scientists believe that could be the most important plant on the planet for humans. Uh, it has all kinds of amino acids, minerals. It has more vitamin C than citrus. It has more potassium than bananas. It has more protein than yogurt. It is just a crazy cool plant. Uh, it's, it's actually uh, next month is when we trim them back. It's hard to see, but behind this citrus you can see where I cut one way back okay and it's only about seven feet tall and all of that growth is from one year okay from and you if you go under there you can see where it was cut uh, all that's one year so I love making tea out of the leaves the bean pods uh, when they're smaller about the size of a straw or pencil you can cook them like green beans uh, I know we have some uh, some neighboring restaurant owners that have like Indian restaurants. They use the bigger pods and they cook them and cut them into segments and the seeds are larger and they have recipes that they eat that whole big seed. I've never tried that, uh, but they say it's really good. Also, it's uh, another great source of uh, food for our chickens. 
So they consume this. So all of their eggs are just unbelievable. We feed them all organic uh, food, but they get a lot of this Moringa and they absolutely love it. Uh, so that's something too that's a, is a great resource for us. If anybody's interested, I can get some of the seed pods that are dry fully. And uh, the best time to plant those is in March here in Phoenix. And, uh, but the weird thing about them, they don't really have aggressive roots. That's why they don't really bother the fence that way like some uh, plants would. But uh, they have a very sensitive calf root. So I found it was best just to poke your finger in the ground <laughs> and put the seed in instead of trying them from a transplant. A lot of times they don't like being transplanted. Now those plants were put in, uh, I planted those in probably about 2016, 17 from seed. Okay, so they grow really fast, but because they grow really fast, the, the wood on them is more like balsa wood. Uh, it's not very strong. So you do want to keep them a little bit smaller, especially if you're harvesting them for a food source. Uh, and then they don't mind being really chopped down. Also, because there's so much minerals and everything in the tree, in the bark, in the, the wood, in the roots, everything, uh, it's a great source. We use that for mulch. We'll use that for bedding material and for chickens. It ends up through the compost and goes through the whole cycle uh, to get back into the soil. So, uh, so with that garden planter, after I put in the trees, you can put in a fence. And they have it all different kinds of material. I designed this fence by myself, but it's just the regular fence blocks that you would have the block panel, the four inch block going in between. But uh, those posts are three and a half inch. They fit right in those cells. You can use the uh, that expanding concrete that uh, really locks them into place. And then I got the, uh, those were two by sixes and I just ripped them in two. It was cheaper buying it that way. And uh, so that was the next thing I put in. And then you can drag in uh, raised beds if you want. But this app, they have everything from composting, chicken coops, fountains. With the, with the raised beds, when you drag that down into your space, it, you can, all kinds of choices. They could be wood, block, brick, willow branches. I mean, a ton of different materials that you can do. And then once you do that with the height, you put in the measurements of it, it gives you your uh, shopping list. Exactly how many blocks you're gonna need, when you, uh, how much soil you're gonna need. If you look at the irrigation, irrigation all runs from this end and it just goes down there that we use the same irrigation that we use in our vertical gardens it has embedded emitters every six inches uh, so it's a measured amount of water more importantly on this material it has built-in filters on either end so it really prevents it from clogging up uh, for instance this past October, out on the street, when we were servicing and changing out the plants, uh, I had noticed some of the emitters were plugged up and were, there's no water coming out of them. So it had been just over 10 years that that material was out there, working just fine, and all we needed to do is just cut it and run new pieces. But what's nice about it is here on the far end, they're just in with one stake. So anytime we need to work in the garden, when we're cleaning it out, all that can come out of the garden. You can work and service the garden and then just lay things back. Now that material also, it's spaced about six inches apart and about six inches, uh, you know, six inch segments there. So it's a really great way to uh, sort of do your square foot gardening too. You can identify the plants that you're putting in and, and just mark that off you know, what kind of space they need. So it's really nice that way to, uh, to be able to do that with these gardens. Um,
Yeah, they go underneath and come up just to make it a cleaner installation on that. And it doesn't need to go that far underneath. All of the, you know, because the, the property's a little bit spread out, so I'm glad you asked the question about the irrigation. She's asking about the lines go underneath. And yes, they go underneath and up inside the bed. Now, all of that is the PVC. And then we just use the poly tubing up here. And the poly tubing, if you're not familiar with it, it's a flexible kind. The PVC is the white material uh, that goes on there. Uh, Do you so, have problems with the poly? You know, we really don't. Like I had mentioned out in the street, that irrigation material had been there for 10 years. Because of the fact it has the built-in admit uh, the emitters and it has filters on either side, it will prevent it from clogging up the little orifices for the drip irrigation. But another thing that we do with the irrigation that I think is really important is depending on the size of your property, a lot of irrigation installers, they will put all the valves in one location and then run the lines all the way across the yard and stuff. If that's done, you really lose a lot of pressure mm. at the end point. Mm. So what we chose to do is to run the hard lines and then put the valves nearest to the point of use. So the valve box for these gardens is right here at the corner of the house. Um, another thing, and we'll talk about it a little bit more, but since you ask about the, uh, um, the calcium, we also have an, uh, it's called fertigation. How many of you have heard of fertigation? Okay, it's a, it's actually, uh, it is an actual term. I didn't make this up. I know this guy's <laughs> looking a little skeptical at me here, but uh, I didn't make it up. But it's, it's been used for a long time with large growers and nurseries, and uh, it's uh, an inline fertilizing system. So it's a tank, and the water is injected into the tank that holds up. Uh, and you can put any kind of water, soluble fertilizer, you can put miracle Grow in the stuff. Uh, but we use all organic, and most of the time it's a seaweed cream that we're using. And uh, with that tank, to help with the calcium buildup, there's a, uh, another product that we run about uh, once a year, and it's called a soil acidifier. As you know, we have alkaline water, alkaline soil. So the soil acidifier helps to service that, but it basically, it's vinegar. It's a concentrated vinegar, and it works great because when it goes through your drip of bitters, it's like running vinegar through your coffee pot. It cleans all that stuff out. So it's, a, it's an easy way to service and maintain your drip irrigation too. And so that's probably why that stuff had lasted so long because of the systems that we use and, and how we use them. Uh, so thank you so much for that question. What's in uh, your soil? Pardon? What, what, how did you get your soil together? It's not out of a bag or anything. Like you know, that. it is. It is? Yeah. What kind? Well, we do, you know, we use a lot of soil. I mean, we're low on it right now for another reason, but uh, we happen to have next week our whole back sewer lines being replaced. So I let some of the supplies go down uh, just so they're not in the way. But I, you know, we buy bulk because people when they buy our gardens they want to be able to use what we recommend and it's all organic and so this material uh, we've added to it over the years but it is a potting soil and then we've added worm castings and compost and things like that that uh, would have been in bulk but most of it is the bag material now for me there's and it, it, it is more expensive for sure than buying the bulk but I've got a big flat cart. I can move 15 cubic uh, feet of that stuff at a time on that flat cart pretty easy by myself. And uh, so it's a little bit more material cost, but it's a whole lot less labor cost. And even for someone who's doing it themselves, you know, at home, you do want to take that in consideration too, because shoveling all that in a wheelbarrow and trucking it around, that can be, uh, uh, you know, you need to calculate all those things in there. and. Uh, you know, I'm pretty lazy with it too. I, I don't like the big bags. I'm, I'm sort of a bigger guy and I can handle that stuff. But I like the one cubic foot bags. 
you know, if we're doing a big garden installation like this, I would get the two cubic foot bags for this, but most of the time it's one cubic foot bags that, that we're using. Um, you know, you it's just, worms? to me, it's easier. You add worms or? Yeah, but you don't really need to do that because on the bottom of this, what we did when we established the gardens to help keep out the Bermuda and stuff that's in the lawn, uh, you know, a lot of people will say to use the uh, boxes. And we've done that and then we go back in and test that stuff and within a few weeks that stuff is gone it the cardboard is going to disintegrate and compost very quickly so don't be fooled it's not going to be a weed barrier uh what i find is best for a weed barrier is palm fronds uh, that's what we've got a, a thick layer of palm fronds on the bottom and when we build raised beds for people if we can source those that's what we like putting on the bottom of those raised beds because of the fact they do not break down very quickly. So this doesn't have a cinder block bottom. It's actually going around. It's, well, we put a footing in and then it's built just like you would a, a block wall. So it's dug down with the footing. Uh, there's the rebar in there. Uh, some of the cells at the corners and the midpoints, because we're going to build a structure. Some of those cells are full of concrete. Okay. Uh, some of them are open. Uh, and then, uh, so again, back to the bottom here, uh, what we do first is we put in, uh, we put in the palm fronds. And if you don't have palm fronds, you can put in a layer of wood chips and stuff on the bottom. I sort of don't like doing that so much because it can throw off the biology of the soil. Um, and in particular, if there's any mixed in with it. And the problem is a lot of times when you buy the bulk stuff, it's got a, it's way too chunky. It'll be great in like two years when it breaks down because the soil biology, it takes nitrogen. That's what feeds the soil and the mycelium and all that kind of stuff. But if there's wood chips in there, that soil biology, it doesn't care about the plant. It knows I need to break down these wood chips. So that's where you're gonna lose that. And a lot of the bulk places, they, they'll sell the fish emulsion. You got to use this you got well it's high in nitrogen and they know because the stuff isn't gonna you're not gonna be able to grow anything into it for a couple of years until it breaks down and you got to water it consistently to keep all that stuff active so after the the palm fronds we have hardware cloth and the hardware cloth it's basically a wire mesh that's like one inch square and we put that down so no critters moles or any kind of ground squirrels they tend to like to dig under and come up and eat the roots and stuff so that's the next barrier and then uh, I do like putting a little bit of landscape fabric down underneath and I, I like doing that because it helps to slow the water mm -hmm. going through there because the landscape fabric the water will go through it but not very quickly so we put a layer of that on and then we build up the soil from that point. How thick is your um, palm fronds on the bottom? You know, I I put in the whole the the stem and the fronds, and you can put a foot of that stuff in there. But then once you do the soil, that's going to compact, and the next season you're probably going to need to do some nice compost on the top, which is going to be a and it could be the steer manure, anything like that that you can put in there that's going to um, uh, add to the soil because you will lose volume and that's why I compost and we top it off every year because you will lose volume of soil uh, with it but you don't really need to continue to add the potting soil because you see the little white stuff in there that's the perlite or the vermiculite that isn't going to go anywhere um, the other the, the material we use it does have some peat um, but it also has a, the cocoa core into it. Now, can you tell me, anybody tell me what, what the deal is with peat and why they use it, why cocoa core? Scotch. I'm sorry? How do you mean? Oh. Scotch. Scotch? A peat moss. Okay. Um, I'm so, I don't understand, That's scotch. A, it's well, it's an ingredient in the liquor. Okay. So, yeah, it, it can hold moisture, and uh, it's sort of inert. It it's, uh, doesn't really add much to it. 
Uh, but the thing is with peat moss and cocoa core, they are actually hydrophobic. They do not like to get wet, but once they are wet, it stays wet, okay? It, it lasts a long time. The problem is with peat moss, um, it's, it is natural, it's organic. Uh, here in the West, that is all coming from Canada. That's where they have big peat bogs up there, but it can take hundreds and even thousands of years for those peat bogs to regenerate themselves. So it's really not very sustainable. Uh, the cocoa core is actually, if you get a coconut the, and you see that hair onto it, it would have had a husk that was removed from the, the coconut. Now that was a waste product. It's something that every year that stuff reproduces. Uh, peat moss will break down pretty quickly in an active soil mix like this. Um, Um, but the peat moss, that will break down really quickly. The cocoa core, just like it's from palms, right? It doesn't break down very quickly at all. So uh, with that, um, it stays in the soil much longer. It used to be a waste product. They would burn this stuff. And then, um, but now they started using it in hydroponics and now they're starting to use it more and more as this great source of what it is, of something that's renewable, easy to regenerate. And I think as organic gardeners, we all wanna be organic, right? right? But there's also things that with organic, it doesn't always mean that it's sustainable. Like, I don't really like the, to use bat guano as a fertilizer. It's a great fertilizer, there's no doubt about that. But when they harvest that out of the, bat caves uh, it Batman doesn't like that <laughs> it can screw up the whole ecosystem of the bats and the caves when they harvest it because they're not caring about the uh, the bats so those are things that you really want to sort of think about as being you know organic that's great but is it really sustainable and harvesting out of those caves it's really not sustainable although it's a great a great source of of, uh, of that and we need the bats so when we go let's go around here a little bit you i want to also mention too leaves. pardon me oh no the broccoli leaves alex wanna... the broccoli leaves are they edible yes and any of this stuff can sample if you don't like it spit it out <laughs> um can I so ask you about the, the cinder block yes the heat and the how do you deal with that with your vegetables? Or do you not grow in the middle of summer? No, we grow all year round. But during the middle of summer, we're going to be growing sort of the three sisters. Oh. And so thank you for that question. Does everybody know what three sisters is? Okay, three sisters is really a, a Native American way of, of planting. And what they, what they found worked really well is they first would plant corn and the corn would last up uh, you know they would plant that let it go for about a month so it'd get a nice start and then uh, corn needs a lot of nitrogen so what they would plant next was their beans or legumes that you know they say that it puts nitrogen in the soil which isn't really true it actually develops the nitrogen as like nodules on the root system itself so um, the, they put the beans in about a month after the corn. The beans also need something to grow on, so they use the corn stalks to grow on. And then about a month after that, they'll plant their squash or melons, and that will create like a ground cover and help to keep the, the, uh, the soil cool and help keep moisture into it. And so they all work together, and it's known as Three Sisters. Uh, but here's the thing, with, with the block like this, transferring through there with the soil and the moisture that's in there and the volume of soil uh, you don't really get a lot of heat transfer through there uh, also there's one other thing that we did with the that we always do with the block beds is this is also has multiple coats of uh, boiled linseed oil 
inside of it. Do you guys know what linseed oil is? Pardon? Uh, it's on the inside of the bed. Uh, and uh, linseed oil is, um, is actually a derivative of flaxseed. So it's organic, it's non-petroleum based. Uh, they boil it and process it that way so it dries quicker. If, they, if you use raw linseed oil, it can take weeks for that stuff to dry. Uh, so you put it there? On the inside of the okay. bed mm -hmm. as a waterproofer, oh. okay? And it seals the block so you don't get any kind of transfer with that. It's also great to use if you're doing wood beds to do it with, because uh, it's great. Uh, boiled linseed oil is great for block, for, uh, for metal, for wood, uh, for mummies. The first, the, seriously, uh, uh, scientists have found on the wrappings of King Tut, the earliest known uses of linseed oil was on his wrappings. There's traces of linseed oil on it. But do so, you look for boiled linseed oil? Yeah, you can't really find linseed oil. I've never ran across it at the hardware store. It's always boiled linseed oil. You can probably get the raw linseed oil online, but what's commonly available is boiled linseed oil. And it's about 35, 40 bucks a gallon. It's going to soak right into this stuff pretty quickly. Uh, and there's probably about four coats of it because we do it until it's not soaking in anymore. And uh, it, it'll dry pretty quickly. And it's a course of a few days process that we're doing that. And uh, so that helps too. Yes. I have a question. So the bottom layer of the cement, is it, oh, that's me, sorry. Is it completely, is this like all filled in the bottom? With cement? Or, yeah. Or no. Or is it just the no. frame? It's just the footing that goes around this, okay. this here. The bottom is open okay. to the ground. It has the palm fronds, okay. the, uh, the hardware cloth, and then uh, that metal wire, and then the landscape fabric, and then the buildup of the soil from there. See, why doesn't the nitrogen attack? That's a bean. Why didn't the nitrogen attack the palm trods, but you said it was the, the, the wood chips? Well, it will at the very bottom. If the wood chips are mixed in, okay. then they're going to be closer to where the roots are going to be, and that's what really throws okay. off the whole biology. So it doesn't of it. seek it out, but it was near no. Anything. It's going to be next to it and around it. That's what'll happen with it. Um, and you know that's why it's really good to if you can put in composted um, um, wood chips. But the wood chips that you get from like a tree trimmer is different because I harvest all this stuff, and I've already got some of it behind my chicken coop. And then I'll go up to you know. A to Z rental and I'll get a wood chipper and those chips are tiny and so those will break down really nicely but if you layer with wood chips and you can see on the top there's some small wood chips there and that's from the old Moringa but as that breaks down on the surface it's also putting in the mycelium the the mushroom spores a lot of times people say oh there's mushrooms going to my soil and they think it's a bad thing I'm like no 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 that means everything is really doing well um, so what we've got here, we've got some peppers that are a little stressed. I haven't even bothered putting the frost cloth on them. We've got uh, uh, some fennel growing there with the purple cabbage. This we've been harvesting for a while and we did that in succession. Uh, so we've got the broccoli here and typically what we'll do is we'll pick one of these that we will leave and we'll let it go to flower and we'll harvest the seeds off that. Have you ever seen uh, a, an actual flowering broccoli? Yeah. It, it's beautiful and the bees love it. And what's really good about doing that in your own garden is it makes that broccoli more acclimated each year to your climate, your environment, your zone, you know, your shade, where your garden is. So each year it gets better and better. But what you really want to do is to try to figure out the best one. And that's the one you don't want to eat. You want to let it go to flower. And then back here, we've got, um, uh, these are artichokes. Uh, taste this stuff here. I'm not going to tell you. You got to taste it. And like I said, uh, it's a weed. But like I said, you can spit it out if you don't like it. 
Yeah, it's arugula. Uh, yeah, this is going to be during the summer. Now, these plants. Put it on your pizza. These plants <laughs> here. Really? Were, uh, you know, once you've gotten one, it will continue to grow and then it sort of dies out and then it'll shoot out another one. Okay. So these have been in the gardens here for quite a while and they just keep regenerating. They, these will probably this year because they've been here multiple years the first year you might be lucky to get you know 10 the next year you could get you know 20 the next year like 30 so these have been in here we'll probably get 30 or 40 off one of each one of these plants yeah they'll shoot up at different times and develop at different times that's what's really great about them uh, is, is how they how they do produce and then over here we've got um, We've got some different varieties of uh, reddishes growing. And these I had last night in a salad, which is wonderful uh, to cut them up in segments. We've got different varieties of beets growing here, uh, carrots. And then these are just, I just noticed these last night, they're just starting to flower. These are sweet peas, so I'm gonna move the trellis over here to let these grow up. And then we have uh, this, uh, this specific Swiss chard has been in the garden uh, for multiple years, and you'll see some in the back garden too. Hey, Justin. Hey. Everybody say hello to Justin. <laughs> uh, so, um, and then we got our little lettuce patch over here, and it was fantastic, because last night we had an amazing salad. I came out, I got some oranges. Uh, that's a Arizona sweet, so it's great for juicing, but uh, we made, I made a, a an orange vinaigrette. We had, uh, you know, the beet greens, the arugula, some um, radishes. We did have some chard in there, and then our lettuces, uh, and then there's some more stuff that we harvest from the back garden as well. Um, so it was just fantastic to be able to come out and be able to do that. Oh, we did. This is nasturtium. Okay. And uh, have you guys tasted nasturtium? No everything okay. and uh, again uh, taste it it has an amazing taste to it and that one with some of the the phytonutrients in that uh, they help to prevent inflammation in the body uh, reduce the chance of cancer I mean it's just amazing what that plant can offer nasturtium what's really great about nasturtium I don't know why the seed packs the seed packs when I bought them I was like oh those are a little pricey but when the these uh, will also flower and uh, they'll have uh, like yellow and orange toned flowers that are also edible and uh, once they uh, uh, once they're pollinated it'll almost be like a little bean pod and the uh, the seeds are quite large they're very easy to harvest uh, so I don't know why they're so expensive you know if you harvest uh, if you try to harvest uh, artichoke seeds has anybody done that yeah that's a dangerous dangerous <laughs> thing I mean you got to wear heavy leather gloves and screwdrivers and it's have you harvested artichoke seeds yeah. Yeah, it's not easy. Not easy. And uh, but you can get a lot of them out of there. And again, when you are harvesting your own seeds, they're getting more and more acclimated to your to your environment and your climate. Now, do you use um, hybrids or are they heirlooms? Well, yeah, that's a great question. Hybrids or <laughs> heirloom, uh, organic, GMO. So basically, all a hybrid is is something that had been naturally cross-pollinated okay so we've been doing that for thousands of years if we didn't we would still have little crab apples uh, that wouldn't really be edible you know that's how all this stuff is developed so hybrids are fine uh, or uh, heirloom is just something that has not been cross-pollinated for like 75 years so it's been the same for that long and then organic just it can be hybrid or uh, heirlooms and organic okay and that has to be a certification 
not all places can afford to do the certification, so that doesn't necessarily prevent me from buying something. Then the GMO, you don't really find a lot of GMO in vegetable gardening stuff. That's going to be in, in your bigger crops, your, your corn, your soy, your wheat. Those kinds of things will have more likely, and a lot of potatoes and stuff, but radishes, you know, they just don't, they just don't do that, and tomatoes, the same thing. Those are radishes, and feel free to grab one and take it. Uh, they are delicious, uh, and there's different varieties of them. You know, and this one, look at these. Beautiful. <laughs> Cool. Now I've got a yeah, those are different varieties of radishes. I've got a hose bib on the side of the house there. Uh, this hose bib, I have four around the fence line. Those are all hooked to the irrigation. So when I use those garden hoses, it's the the fertilizer water that comes out. So if you want to rinse it, use the one on the house there. And um, the reason I asked you about that. No, they can't. Not all, but most of them can't. It just means that they were cross pollinated to right. try to get the best of both worlds. Right. And for example, uh, hey Justin, have you heard of this uh, place called Seven Row? It's back in New York. Uh, they're doing seeds and stuff. But anyway, the it's a farm restaurant about an hour outside of New York City. Uh, that this and it's one of the like the top Michelin restaurant, one of them in the entire country. And it's on a farm. They grow the food that is harvested and goes in there. And the the courses, if you ever check it out, uh, the courses. I mean, they're crazy. Like twenty course meals. And it takes you more than a year to get a reservation to go to this place. So they have been doing these hybrids and the place is called Seven Row. So they have, you know, because a lot of what is produced and has been produced is really not produced for flavor. It's produced for production and shipping. So what they're doing is they're producing them specifically for flavor. So the squash, the tomato, all the stuff. So I just ordered some. It was uh, on CBS um, Sunday Morning News uh, about two months ago. They did something on it. And I have heard of the place over the years. But then they've been working, I think, with Cornell University uh, to develop these, uh, these specific uh, hybrids. And they have some really cool stuff. And they, I think they only have about 15 different varieties at this point that they've developed. Um, and, and you can order this one? You can order, no, you can order the seeds. The seeds, okay. What's the name of the company? Seven Row. <laughs> These radishes just stick it up halfway. They grow like that? They, I mean, they yeah, that's a variety. Like that? That's the variety of them, yeah. They're really mild. Wow. They're very mild. Is that a so, French okay. breakfast radish? Is that what they yeah. use? So it, you started from seed and oh, yeah. grew up? And then Particularly your root vegetables are best to start from seed. Uh, some of your other vegetables, you can certainly start them from seed. It's like the tomatoes that we have up there. Those are tomatoes because those are going to be still... Uh, what, what do you think for the tomatoes going in the gardens here? So I, I don't do tomato seeds in a garden straight. Mm -mm. No, I'll start those But when would outside. you... I have tomatoes up there that we started in the house, uh -huh. and we have some up there for sale. When would you say would be the good time to put those in your garden? After February 15th. Basically, a after you take care of Valentine's Day, you got the next day. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's your best time. You know, love been your been family, then love your garden. Right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I was in Al, uh, about a month ago, and they're growing, but they, and they have the flowers. The flowers are holding up, but they're not giving me. Yeah, because the the tomatoes they like that Goldilocks zone, not too not too cold, which is too cold for them right now, and not too hot. So a lot, and basically there's two different varieties of tomatoes, and that's it. There's indeterminate, which are the vining ones, 
and there's determinant, which are the bush or patio varieties. The bush or patio varieties, much smaller, they produce and it's sort of one and done, right. and the plant's done. The indeterminate, that's where most of your varieties are in that category. And uh, those, if you get them in the right spot, with a little bit of protection from cold, with some protection from the heat, uh, they can limp through those times and then you can cut them back if you get some dead. And once the, they get to that Goldilocks zone again, they'll take off. And we've had, we've had tomatoes for two, three years in the ground that you'll cut them back and they'll just produce again. But that's only the indeterminate or the, uh, the vining varieties. And that's where, you know, 99% of your, your tomatoes are in that category. So, um, is there any more questions about the upfront gardens here as we move around and progress around the back? This is so exciting. Good, good. <laughs> um, so we have a couple yeah, of things this here. This is a, a popular line that we put in the ground a few years ago. This is a, a Pakistani mulberry. Uh, and this coffee line, you can tell it's unique because it's the only line uh, the only citrus that has the double leaf structure to it. This double leaf, it also is, they use that a lot in Thai cooking. It's one that they will use in that. So if you want, pull off one of the leaves and crumble that up in your fingers. And uh, the fruit that's on this line, yeah, it's very rough in texture, sort of lumpy. Uh, you can just barely squeeze it and it just lights up with oil uh super oil and then these two are valencias and uh so alex can i add something on this kefir lime oh you bet i'm a crook so this type of lime is the only type of lime that you can actually cook with so that you cook the leaf and you cook that right into your meals and stuff and it gives that limey flavor without losing the limey flavor so if you try to juice a lime into something you're cooking you end up cooking off the flavor that's why you always add the lime after the fact but the lime leaf on these ones, you get the limey flavor right in the soup or whatever you're doing, especially if you're stewing it. It's, it's a great one. So it's the leaf that's actually you use with this. The, the fruit definitely does look more like a, looks like a brain. Yeah. It looks like this crazy looking brain fruit. And they're not very good at all. They're very pithy. They're not worth really much at all, except to amaze your friends because you can show them you've got this brain fruit. And they usually, quote, ripen around... Uh, Halloween, so yeah. that's kind of a fun thing that we do with those. And what kind of lime tree is this? Macruck or kafir uh, depends on what your nationality is. But Either I'm one of those might be offensive. Double leaf actually, version. Yeah. So yeah. this one. It's is... a leaf, so it's only the leaf that you're really you're cultivating, and that's what you're using to eat. Oh, K-E-F-I-R. Filipino. Oh, kafir. Okay. Yes. Yes. Yep. And uh, and it's that lime tree, right? Yeah. Kafir. Yeah. It's K-A-I-F-I-R. Oh. I feel like I'm in a sixth grade spelling bee. <laughs> Put me on the spot. Yeah. So these are also some really old oh my gosh. trees, and I like to point these out because if you do plant citrus, they're all grafted. You know, all your citrus is going to be grafted, and you can really see that in an older tree. This sort of knuckle here, mm -hmm. that is the grafting union. So the what they use as the rootstock is the sour or artificial citrus, and. The only thing that you would use that fruit for, they make marmalade with it because it doesn't have a lot of sugar and so you can put the sugar into it. But if you see anything growing out down there, you want to cut that off. And also you want to make sure that that is not, has soil around it because it breathes there. And it's a really quick, easy way to kill a citrus is if you put the, the soil up there. And again, these are super old trees. I learned this uh, from Justin and from my old dear friend that lived at the house here about um, when you're selecting your citrus I always juice the stuff that's on the south and the west side of the tree it typically is going to have more seeds in it and the the stuff on the north and uh, uh, the east side that's what we're going to be peeling and eating mm -hmm. typically will have less seeds in it and also the stuff on the interior of the tree do you know, since you got the um, 
the well water, right? The, the flood irrigation, the flood irrigation. Yeah. So we had a tangelo in that was planted in yard, but we had the sprinklers. Do you know if, I mean, it was fine. It seemed to work out okay. But do you know if, if you don't have the, the flood irrigation is the best way to irrigate? Weekends? Yes. Uh, and again, these are things that maybe you want to take this one, Justin, about watering the citrus. Yeah, so on citrus, they love the more flood irrigation definitely more than they would spray because okay. spray is going to only give you a little bit of water at the top surface. You want to deep water these. I like to let my citrus dry out the top two inches before I would water it again, and then I water it deeply. And if you don't stress them out a little bit by having that top area uh, dry, you're not going to get fruit. So that's an interesting thing about citrus is they... They only produce fruit when they know they need a posterity to keep them, you know, keep their posterity alive, I guess you could say. That's kind of how it seems. If they're happy all the time and they're watered, like, frequently, they are not going to produce a single fruit. They're just going to sit there and grow a bunch of leaves. You might get a little bit of fruit, but if you want maximum fruit, you need to let it dry out a little bit, which is better to just have it on a timer, deep watered, maybe and once a month. I mean, a tree like this, once a month is fine, summertime, twice a month. Yeah, exactly. And that's when, when I talked to you guys about this whole area being the Pierce family farm, it was all set up, the irrigation, and it still runs to this day on the same schedule that it was set up to. So like Justin had said, right now, the flood irrigation only comes about once a month. And uh, during the summer, it's once every 14 days, okay? And here, it'll get six, eight inches of water in the yard, but also, a lot of people think that's really wasteful. And you know, with the water issues that we're going into, I communicated with, uh, uh, years ago, with SRP when we really got started here. And what I learned from that is, you know, the, the water that comes through the canal systems, it's coming from the um, reservoirs and things like that. So it's really not clean water. It's not something that we could drink. But under all of this land where this, you know, the flood irrigation is in Phoenix, it could be as little as 20 feet below is the aquifer. So that water percolates into the aquifer and it's the very first step of the water filtration. When it's in the aquifer and they pump it out with the wells, it'll go through more, for, uh, more uh, filtering and it'll end up in your tap water. But Phoenix area here is in a whole different, uh, whole different, setting than California because our aquifers are full and they have been full for a very long time because of how we do this. So when you drive by and you see the flood irrigation, you might think that it's wasteful, but it is part of a much larger system. And um, so with the watering, then you also, there's like four times a year you want to really do the fertilizing. If you don't, if you're not fortunate enough to have this kind of um, irrigation, and by the way, it's we just got our irrigation bill you have to pay it once a year and it was like 150 dollars and uh i asked him one time how much water is that like for my size of lot which is about a half an acre it's roughly 80,000 gallons of water every time the irrigation runs so 160,000 gallons of water a month during the summer if you don't have that, like uh, the fruit trees that you see up front, when we set those up in these properties, we'll do a large well of at least about six foot in diameter for smaller trees like that. And then we'll have multiple bubblers, which the water could just come out of that and it will fill up that, that whole well and then you sink it down. And there's other tools that we use. It's like a rod that you can push down into the ground. If, if it's watered correctly, it'll go down with very uh, not a whole lot of resistance and then where the water it's not down at that level you're not pushing that rod anymore so those are the ways that you want to do it but the bubblers are the best way to, to set those up so you would want to add a separate zone or valve for your for your fruit trees and it could be citrus or you know pomegranates peaches whatever it is that you have Okay, no. So the question is, is how do I fertilize in a flood irrigated property here? So what I do is, you ever seen the bulb planters uh, to plant like tulip bulbs? It uh, has a hole, uh, like a piece of metal 
and it takes out a plug, almost like if you were at a golf course for the, uh, and so I stand on that, bring that up, uh, bring that whole plug out, and it's gonna be about this far below the ground. I'll put uh, the fertilizer in there, and then put that plug right back in. Now we'll do that about every three feet all the way around the drift line of the tree, okay? And the fertilizer that we have up in there in those small bags, that uh, uh, bioflora, the dry crumbles, that's what we use here uh, to fertilize them. You know, Arizona Best is a really nice fertilizer a lot of people use, but that is not organic. It's a synthetic fertilizer. Okay, let's head around here. Just come in here. I know, you said you had the party at 11. <laughs> I, you know, the tag was on there years ago. These were the best teacher of any garden is the guy's garden. Variety. But this one, this one is really my favorite. And this one is probably, you know, this was probably planted in the 50s, in the early 50s, this rose bush. It was planted in my neighbor's yard. The, when we moved here, the original owners lived over there. It was this tiny little lady. She smoked constantly. She got big bottles of vodka and gin at Walmart and the plastic bottles. I was over there one time and she brought out these Vogue magazines with this beautiful woman on the cover. I'm like, who is that? That was her, it was Dee. When she was young, she was a fashion model and she was, on the cover of Vogue. Well, when she passed, her family, the, the place was abandoned for a while and we sort of took care of it, kept an eye out on the property. And this rose was on the back wall of the fence. And I asked him, can I, uh, can I uh, uh, take that rose? And I dug it up and planted it over here. Hey, Justin, could you do me a favor? Can you go close that front gate? I need to let these hounds of uh, out because they're going to tear up the house, I think. So come on over here. The war chance. So this was the, the, the garden that I did for my father. I'm going to let right now. They get to howling so loud. <laughs> Hey, hey. Hi, my baby. So, um, this is Savannah, and that's Harper. He's like seven, eight months old. Oh, my God. So this was the garden that started it off. And in March of 2012, we have a, this is one that we get a lot of harvest out of. Also, um, on these plants right here, you can see this uh, it almost looks like a, a palm tree. And this one uh, has been in here for about three years now, this plant. During the summer, it comes way out here. And uh, I want to talk a little bit about microclimate. This one faces directly south. So during the summer, it can take all that great uh, sun. As the sun comes up higher in the sky, the gardens shade themselves, but plus we've got this big overhang. So during the middle of the summer, these gardens are in the shade, you know, all the time. Um, so this has been a really great environment for them. And we did, I did this custom one with the compound miters around the corner there. So it is a really nice feature. This Savannah. is, our, this is uh, the master bedroom. It helps to keep that warmer during the, the summer or during the, the winter, cooler during the summer, helps the, the sound and stuff uh, block a little bit. And uh, so these are some other of the trees that we have. We've got pomegranates, we've got a couple of peaches and a plum over here. That's a pomegranate. And uh, uh, this is the ruby. Pomegranates can be trained up so they can they can work more like a tree or a canopy type thing, but they're still gonna always be this kind of bushy look. You always want it multi-branched at the bottom, otherwise you won't get any fruit. Well, yeah, I mean, microclimates are an important piece of the puzzle for all of you 
maybe imagine in your mind for a minute what where your how your yard is oriented or where your house is like what way is north so north for us right now is 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 up there and so this being on the south side these types of areas right here great for growing your greens pretty much year round that's why this thing can keep growing like this because it gets more shade in the summertime because otherwise in the summertime these things get burned if they're in full sun so that's why this thing can be grown year in and year out this is a third year right yeah, about a third year on that. And the kale. Yeah, the kales will also be in those kind of categories as well, especially this type, the Tuscanas. Mm -hmm. These guys will be able to grow year in and year out as long as they get some good shade during the summer months. But in the winter months, they like the extra light, and then they don't bolt. So that's the other thing you can tell. These guys didn't bolt. They didn't shoot flowers out, kind of like this uh, arugula is right here. Mm -hmm. So if you like arugula, I mean, this is, this is extra spicy right now. <laughs> so good stuff. So microclimates are very important, especially growing here in Arizona. And did you guys notice where his, his uh, beds were in the front? Oh, yeah. They were mostly in full sun. Yeah. So they were out of the shade, just far <laughs> enough away from the house that even in the winter time, there was no shade hitting it. So if he put it even three feet closer up to the house on one section, it would have been in the shade and he wouldn't have had much production in the, in the, in the winter time. Now in the summertime, he's gonna be growing totally different things than he's gotten there right now. Yeah. But a lot of things he's growing in those beds right now, like we're seeing here, could be grown in these beds because they're gonna be in the shade most of the summertime. So it's important to know where your microclimates are. So what we call this area right here, this ends up being basically a, a, a B microclimate, so a full sun microclimate in the, in the wintertime. Mm -hmm. But in the summertime, it's more of an E microclimate. So it gets some partial sun, more reflected light. Doesn't get a lot of direct sun at all, except on that front side, mm -hmm. that'll get some direct sun. But what type of sun is that side getting on that part of the house? None. None at the moment. Well, none at the moment, but in the summertime or even in the afternoon, where's the sun going to be? It's going to be on that side. Yep. And so that western faced side, we call that a C microclimate. So it gets morning shade, afternoon sun. So that's a totally different space. It's going to get blaring hot in the in the summertime, but in the wintertime, it's places where the only place, and you can see he's got productive tomatoes actually right there on this corner. So he's got a red tomato right there and that's because it's in a C microclimate. It gets a lot of good sun and especially gets the warmest sun in the winter time. Now in the summertime it's going to have a little bit more of a challenge but only for the parts that are growing along that back side. Now he's got it in the perfect little spot right there because in the summertime it's going to get partial shade which means it's going to keep being productive. That's probably your at least your second maybe your third year in that spot. Is that about right? Yeah but the, this microclimate changed over the year. You had a tree this, there. I had a, a peach tree that yeah. something happened to it, and one of the branches died off. He cut it, and then boom, the other one died off. So there was a big peach tree here. That, so now things that are happening here, we're going to have to change because the microclimate's changed because it's lost that food. Oh. Yeah, so growing tropicals, we can grow things. So anybody know what, uh, what climate zone we're in when it comes to USDA? There's like different numbers. So we're 9B, sometimes 9A, 9A or 9B, depending on it. 9, 9A if you're kind of living up closer into Phoenix, and then 9B if you're living further out and kind of uh, Scott or like the, the outer rim, I guess you could call it, you know, Queen Creek, kind of where I'm at. Now, if you run your microclimates right, you can actually expand your growing by plus or minus two. So I can go down to seven, which would allow me to grow cherry trees, and we have productive cherry trees here in Arizona. We've actually got uh, six different varieties of, of traditional cherries that can produce cherries here when you get in the right microclimate. And then we can go all the way to 11, which is more of a tropical zone like Florida, so you can grow bananas. But it's all based on where you plant it based on microclimate. Most of your traditional data that you're gonna get, your master gardener approach is all about full sun agriculture. That's how they operate. They'll teach you about microclimates, but it's not classified relative to well, when do I grow a tomato in an E microclimate? And they'll say, what do you mean? Well, if you're putting it in a microclimate, it'll help it out. They'll give you a lot of generalities. But what, what we've done in agriscaping is that we've dialed in when do you plant what in the correct microclimate. So we classified these six different microclimates, A through F. And all because it's an F, meaning full, it's a full shade environment, doesn't mean you can't grow in it. You can actually grow year round in that too, but you're gonna grow a different thing at a different time than what's on your traditional calendar. And so you imagine now you've got, rather than just your single calendar you get from the U. You, you get from the Master Gardeners, you get one calendar. That's for a B microclimate, for growing veg. That means it's full sun, and that's the calendar for that zone. But if you want to grow in an A microclimate, 
you got a different calendar for that zone. If you want to grow in a C microclimate, you got a different calendar for that zone. Does that make sense? And so you might have been growing a using that traditional calendar and you're growing in a different microclimate expecting the same result. So that's one of the major failure components that I see in people that fail in their gardens. It's because they put the, the right plant in the wrong location, but they didn't know because they're like, well, it says on the calendar, according to, according to the master gardeners, this is when I should plant. But if you put it in the wrong location, it's not the right place. It's not the right time. I talked to them a little bit about the garden planner. Yes, so the garden and, uh, planner so has a... You can really expand on that. The garden planner actually has, if you go to agriscap or gardenplanner.agriscaping.com, that actually has, you get access to the agriscaping garden planner. And that one, you can literally click on a month and it'll, it, there's a chart that basically it'll show you what to plant in each of the microclimates relative to that month. And so it changes. And it's also got it broken down so you got low, medium, and high, as well as vines. So if you really want to design with it, and that's the other thing, there's a lot of design constraints when you're trying to grow veg because there's 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 a limitation on, well, what I can grow where and all that kind of stuff. And if you try to create the same pretty picture around a perimeter, it's like, oh, you got two different microclimates, which means everything's planting at different times. It's not going to look the same. But if you got the microclimate map and that helps you out, well, then what you got is you can literally grow one variety of strawberries along this wall and another variety along that wall and you still get production and you still have strawberries. So that's another thing that we've done with agriscaping is we've broken it down to the different types, the varieties, some are better in some places and than others. Like if I was going to grow in this type of a, if I was wanting to grow strawberries and these things are amazing for growing strawberries. I got strawberries over there in that one. Awesome. Yeah, exactly. So he's got it right there, similar microclimate and he's growing strawberries right there. I love it there because it keeps it away from all the animals, the critters and then you, you can keep them dry. I mean, there's a, you know the, the base of it dry. They can hang over the side. It looks really pretty. But if I was going to put those in an A microclimate, which would be a morning sun, afternoon shade environment, I would use a different variety of strawberry than I would in a space like that. So I'm guessing those are quinaults or sequoias. Yeah. Those are like. And there's a new variety too that was over there that it's, it's marketed as the farm, uh, farmer's market variety, but it's a new hybrid uh, that we're sampling. I got those uh, a while back. But they seem to be doing good. Cool. And if you want them in a C microclimate, so it gets a lot of sun, you're going to want to really focus on a variety here called the Chandler variety. The Chandler variety can handle that type of heat. And then if you're in a more shady environment or underneath trees, even under citrus, you can grow strawberries. Go with a Loran or a Tristan. The Lorans and the Tristan, much lower growing. They're more like a ground cover. It's a smaller strawberry, but big on flavor. And then the Tristan is actually a pink flowering strawberry, which is kind of fun. So a variety of places, uh, one of my favorite suppliers here right now, I mean, if you've been to Baker Nursery, I don't even know if it exists anymore. It doesn't. They got rid of it. See, that was my favorite place that, this side of town. The sisters sold it. They did. And it's uh, Baker Villa or something, these uh, really nice homes uh, <laughs> over there. So do you have a favorite place you go up here? You know, uh, uh, Barrage Nursery. Barrage is great. Right here. It's an old family one. I think the grandfather started it. Now the granddaughter. Uh, run it now, so it's been there for a long time. It's on Camelback and roughly about 48th Street, so it's just a few blocks uh, east of just go up 44th and turn on Camelback. It's on the south side of the road. Great place there for a lot of the varieties. And then in some of the other ones, Whitfield is another old. Uh, I think that's where I had. Uh, we were doing a garden project for a family, some of the the vertical garden, and she had those uh, strawberries last year and I was like where did you get these these look amazing and it happened to be at Whitfield and she lived by there so I went over and got some by years ago and that's where those are from. So another good one to go to is uh, Summer Winds and you'll be looking specifically for something from Velarde Garden. So Velarde actually grows right here in Phoenix and then she sells to Summer, Summer Winds Nurseries and so you can find those at a couple different locations. A and P Nurseries often have that if you're more East Valley. Uh, and then also, uh, they do sell direct at some of the farmer's markets. I yeah. know uh, Roadrunner Park, they sell there too. Velarde. Velarde yeah, sells she's there. there. Alex is the guy that uh, heads that up for there. Yeah, so those are some great places to go. Well, here's the misnomer, and I know it looks like they're eating them, but they're not actually eating them. The, the roly-polies, the isopods, the little pill buds, they're not the ones, 
initially eating it. It's rotting first and then they eat the rot. So they don't eat the fresh strawberry. Oh yeah, you'll see them on there, but they're eating rot, which means that you probably don't have, that's why they call them strawberries, because you usually need a mat of straw to keep the strawberry part dry. Because if it doesn't stay dry, the strawberry itself, they will start to rot. And then the roly polies love to come in and they'll start eating all the rot that's happening around that, that particular fruit, especially on the underside. And they'll, looks like it's pitting it out, but if you notice what they're eating, they're only eating the rotting, slimy part and they're not eating the actual firm part of, of, of the strawberry. Yeah, elevate the strawberries themselves or get some mulch underneath them. Yeah, get a raised garden like this. This is another way to keep them off. That's another easy way to do it. That's, that's, that's sort of, of why they call them strawberries. Yes. They do really benefit from not having that contact with the soil. Yep. Uh, it does, like you said, to keep them dry, and that's strawberries. Yep, so one of my favorite things to use, if, if you got a pine tree or a neighbor with pine trees, pine straw, so the pine straw has that darker color rather than the bright stuff, and it, and it breaks down a little bit better and actually acidifies the soil. And with a little bit of acidifier with strawberries, you have better production, better flavor, there's a lot of good things to get with more acidification of the soil. Do you do the loose seed, loose seed oil on these? Well, I did that in, uh, no, not in the interior, because these are all lined with uh, a food grade liner that's on the inside. And then there's perforations where this this drainage diverter material is, so it only drains here, okay. and it drains into the garden uh, below it. And ours is the, you know, I was, I was, it, I got a patent on this this time. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh, this is the only garden that I've ever seen that can be put on a wall That's that does not require a separate vapor barrier to be installed. And when they say a vapor barrier, if you look at any of what they're talking about. They're talking about basically everything that you would build behind your shower uh -huh. before you put the tile on it. Okay. Now, this has been here since March of 2012. I've got some of that stuff down there, but that's from the flood irrigation. Up above that, you can see there's no staining on the wall. And if you ever, with one of our gardens, you see it draining a little weird or it's draining someplace other than when you think it should, what probably happened is maybe one of the plants has grown or the line got pushed so it's now the water is dripping in between the liner and the wood now we do them in now we do them in different colors like a, a, a sort of a medium dark brown and a, like an espresso color and like an ebony color as well black colors if if you purchase the gardens that way everything all edges of it you dip it in uh, to, to do that multiple times with the linseed oil and have it stained in it. Uh, because when, when a lot of times we ship these gardens out and if you don't do it on all sides, you know, maybe they want to have it on another side. But if it's a garden that you have that's been installed, what, what we do uh, in servicing them too, and we recommend for people to do this, to freshen up the wood, use that linseed oil. You can add a little bit of just a regular Minwax stain, no polyurethane, nothing like that in it. And then when you do your plant change out, just roll over the outside and the leading edge with the, just the roller. And if some of that dribbles in the soil, it's organic, it was on King Tut's wrapping, just <laughs> doesn't matter. Yeah. Um, you know, so it's a really easy way to do just the outside yeah. of it. Though. I was wondering about the moisture against the masonry. Yeah, yeah, it just doesn't happen yeah. because of the liner yeah. uh, that's there. And we manufacture all those right here. We've got to do the patterns and then seal them. and. Make so sure the all the drainage lines up. <laughs> Pardon? Evaporation. Well, it, you know, it's all drip irrigation, so you don't really get a lot of evaporation. Now, for instance, out on the street, that's really I would consider that at our place. That's the hardest of all environments here. It's all it's the afternoon western sun that blasts on that. Plus, you've got the wind of the traffic there and all that. Um, so, when I set up the irrigation. For our gardens, but it works also if you're doing any kind of container gardening. Uh, have your irrigation go on about two o'clock in the afternoon, during the hottest part of the day. What happens in the smaller volumes? It keeps the soil cool, and it helps the root zones to stay cool, so the plants are happy. Now, during the summer, when it's above 100, we'll have the irrigation turn on for about 10 minutes once a day. Once it gets to about 110, 
we do a short run time in the morning of about three minutes and then the main run time in the afternoon and that will that's how it works and with the emitters when you're doing that kind of timing it equates to about a gallon of water per level you know when when you're doing a 10 minute run time so they're just very low water use you shouldn't have a lot of water running out of the out of the bottom it's going to drain a little bit but we have these indoors and when we go up Yvonne we had a, a poster done of an indoor garden of ours it's in a restaurant uh, called Hudson Hill in Denver and it's they got that garden from us in about 2016 they uh, uh, just posted this on their Instagram about six months ago and I says hey can I have a picture of this and it's indoors the only thing that's different is we have little L brackets and little catch trays that sit underneath this drainage material at the bottom and it catches that water. You can drain it back into the garden. Uh, so, you know, we do these on big commercial installations. We're going to be servicing a garden that we did in 2017. The bottom of that garden is about 12 feet off the ground. It's at a on a fourth floor party deck in this high-end apartment complex. And we're gonna, uh, that one, we hooked up, a, we installed a copper gutter underneath it that runs, that, and that copper gutter, it transitions into a one inch pipe that drains into the scupper. Uh, so there's no drainage water there. I put those plants in at that time, and uh, you know, it's elephant food which is a great source of food too. Uh, ounce for ounce has as much omega-3 fatty acids as a salmon. It tastes like a mild green apple with a little salt on it. Uh, we had a little bit of that in our salad last night. Uh, so it's really great and that grows all year round, but that's what that one has in it. Um, and uh, it, just, it just performs. We're gonna be doing a few upgrades with it here in the next month or so, but uh, nothing's been done to that garden since 2017. So it's just really easy. So do you need any, do you want to talk anything else about uh, the microclimates? I wanted to go over and talk about our smart irrigation. Let's go stuff. talk about that. What questions do you have? I guess that's what it all comes down to. Yeah. I know the best teacher of any garden is the guy who's gardening it. So. <laughs> what are you going to put down there at the bottom? Anything? You know, I don't really put a whole lot in there because when I let the chickens go, I'll put mulch and stuff in there. Uh -huh. And the, that, the chickens go and get all kinds of bugs from there so every oh, day when we let them out. And if you don't know what elephant's food is, this is elephant's food right here. Yeah, please taste it. It's edible. You can eat that. So if it's nice and full like this one is, it's going to have a nice, yeah, kind of a, a Granny Smith apple kind of flavor. I, I love putting them on a fish taco. You got a crunchy, limey kind of flavor. The chickens like it too. Those bare ones down there, that's where the chickens peck them. However you want to, put them on fish tacos and salad, but taste it, it's, yeah. it's a great source of food. Yeah, these are adeniums, and I've got a few adeniums here, uh, desert roses. I have put protection on them here. Um, this week you probably going to need Yeah, I put one on, um, just put it away, and it's sitting over there, the crosswalk. Those are fig trees with the mulberries for cutting for starting. So, so it's just banana. Here's the Alex. Those are bananas. Yeah, I want to know about the trees. So this one and these. Like these are. Oh, this tropical stuff. I mean, this is really good. Cool. So a little bit with the trees. This here is a Florida Prince. Uh, peach. The peaches are amazing. This is a Waddell Giant pear. Uh, I did shape this one a little bit too. Pear trees tend to really grow vertical. We put some spreaders in here to, to have it spread out a little bit more, but you can see how it really does like to grow up vertical. I, I pruned this one already. There's a few more that I'm gonna take out, some of the smaller ones. I cut off the suckers that grow straight up, the water sprouts that, uh, on those. This one's a plum, that's another uh, peach tree over there. And, uh, and these are ice cream bananas. Uh, took a little bit of a hit here uh, with the cold, but they will snap right back. I had my first bananas this year from them and they were just remarkable. They're little, they're only about four or five inches long, mm -hmm. but it tastes like vanilla ice cream. Uh, they taste awesome. So you don't have to do pairs with these guys? I mean, to cross pollinate? You don't need to cross pollinate. Okay. This one here, it's called a Waddell Giant. 
uh, my friend over at uh, Reed at RSI Growers, it's one that he sort of has cultivated over the years. And uh, the story is that he told me that one of his friends in Waddell had this weird pear tree, really large pears, and come over and they looked at it and it was not a known variety. It sort of morphed into its own thing and uh, over in Waddell, so that's the tree that I got from him. And again, this was one of the pear tree that's up front. It was, that was the same size. This was put in in about 2016. Uh, and then out of that 15 gallon container. What kind of tree is it? That's a, that's a Florida oh, Prince. Is this is a Waddell pear. Those are, those are peaches over there. That upright one there is a plum, and then these are ice cream bananas. And for those of you that don't know, you really just need one banana, and then it'll shoot up what's called pups. So once that one mother tree, it produces the flower, and uh, you get your bananas from it, that one will die, but it would have already shot up multiple pups that will be what comes in next. And I sort of wanted to create a theme here with my chicken coop. <laughs> Uh, a little bit more tropical and uh, oh. this is a, a great place for because this is a deep part of the irrigation so when the flood irrigation comes it's like flushing a giant toilet a lot of that stuff goes in there so it gets nutrients to our uh, sort of mother tree of the property there the the uh, pecan tree and that pecan tree just without this in the microclimate in the backyard it would be really rough but it, you can see the spread of that tree and it really benefits the neighbor as well, uh, that tree. And I have no idea how old that tree is, uh, but it's a... I'm guessing 45. Just based on size. We have, yeah. we have some big pecan orchards we run down. Yeah, Queen so it's, it's a great one. I did have to have, you can see now there's that wire going there because in the crotch of it, uh, a while back we had it trimmed in a little bit. Uh, during some of the winds, I could go over and look at that and that would actually open up so they put that cable in there to sort of tie everything together to to make sure that the tree stays healthy and stuff but here oh i'll trim that up and thanks for bringing that up my wife hates it right now can't you do anything with those it's like no not really because that does still give protection to the trees during these cold times so but once that passes i'll be able to trim it up and the new stuff will just grow right back in there. Um, we do have some uh, uh, dragon fruit, and that comes from the mother one on that corner there. But uh, uh, the chicken coop, the way that I had this set up is really to make it easy uh, to not have to go in there. Uh, I only go in there about once a month to clean it out. I uh, take the, the wood shavings from the sawdust from the shop and some other material that we'll put down in there for bedding. That will either come out here or it'll go into the compost and uh, starts that whole process. And with the wood shop, I always have a, a sawdust that I put in there. On that side over there, there's four tubes that come down and you can see them there. Uh, so I go on that other side and those tubes will hold one 50 pound bag of feed. And I have to feed them, it's about every 10 days. They'll go through about 50 pounds of feed. Uh, so I removed those caps. There's a little shelter that we have built over it. So when it rains, it doesn't get wet. And then on this side, no barking. On this side is the water. And it just comes down and it runs right to just before the, the gate there. And underneath it has little stainless steel nipples so they pick at it and they peck at it and the water drips out so I never have to clean it. If any of you guys have chickens, you know they can be dirty and you, you typically see the water containers just on the ground. You gotta clean those things every day because they'll just get full of muck. Uh, so this is really nice. And then over here, I just open that up and Put the, the eggs. eggs in the little basket. Oh, nice. It's a little cheaper than eight bucks a dozen, right? Yeah, no doubt. And uh, they just come out that way. Oh, they're nice yeah, they're probably in their nest, and that's oh, they'll do that. Oh, and multiple ones can get in there at, at the same time. That's a Florida. Oh, 
No, they, they're in there nesting right now. They're laying the egg. When they get up, it's on an angle, so it'll just roll in here. And it's on typical nesting boxes, the egg stays there. And the chicken's gonna poop on the eggs. So then you have to clean the eggs. But if they're, if, if you can get the eggs clean, when the hens lay the egg, there's a water soluble uh, film that's on that egg it's, that seals it. But the minute you have to rinse it, it rinses away and then that egg can get Simonelli. So this is the way that you can do it without having to, to, to do anything with it. And also any of the dirty eggs, uh, we feed raw diets to the dogs and they get eggs and uh, the raw eggs uh, and the shell and everything because there's a lot of minerals and stuff in there that is good for the bones and extra calcium for the dogs, especially big ones. So that's how we uh, uh, do the uh, do the eggs. I did want to talk about because we mentioned this earlier when we were up front about the irrigation. So this is the smart controller. And uh, so as you can see, there's nothing on the screen there. Everything is run off of an app off your phone. And what's really nice about it, I've got uh, 16, as uh, a 16 station, I think I'm using 14 of them. Uh, I like to have a lot of control, everything set up differently uh, because this one needs different than that one. You know, the ones on the street needs different schedules than the ones at the gate. Um, so what's really nice is when you program this, it, this also hooks to your local weather stations, not the TV station, but weather stations in your neighborhood. So if you've got sprinklers for your lawn, for instance, and it's windy, it will know that it's windy and you'll get a little message. Uh, we're, you know, we're not gonna run the sprinklers right now because it's too windy. We'll let it go when the wind dies down. Uh, also, if there's rain, it knows how much it's rained in your area. So it will change the skip. If it's just getting a trace of rain, it may not skip it. But if we got a, a half an inch or so of rain, it's gonna skip it for more days. And with the rain that we've been getting, really the lawn hasn't really been, been watered. Um, so that's one of the really great things about that. And uh, when you, when you uh, program everything, it's gonna ask you with your fruit trees, does it have bubblers? And it will, you put in that it's fruit trees with bubblers. It, these are inline emitters. So it can calculate how much water is going through those to make sure that the timing and everything is right for you. And it will change throughout the year. So as it gets hotter, it's gonna change the frequency and, and it can change the duration as well. And then here is where we do the fertilizing. Mm -hmm. So this is just the injection tank here. And so it just, uh, this holds a gallon and a half of the organic fertilizer. This is the, the fertilizer we use in this one right now. And uh, so it's hooked up before any of the valves. So when a valve opens up, the water is injected into the tank through this black line, and then it's injected into the line through this one. And this one, you can tell it's dirty looking, uh, but that's telling me that there's fertilizer going through there. When mm. it's clear, so that tells me I need to fill it. So I just dump that out and fill it back up um, and install it back in the box. I always do put it in a separate valve box because they are heavy. If it slipped, if, if there was other valves, it could certainly break a valve. Um, but then also we have these little ones here that are really nice as well. They can just hook right to your garden hose and fill that up and water by hand with your water wand. And that's another great way of using those liquid fertilizers because we always have that question, you know, am I watering, uh, am I fertilizing enough? Is it not so much? And it's just a simple dial uh, on the top from fast to slow. And it's just really simple and easy. And the thing is, if you put one of these in with your main irrigation, if it does run out of fertilizer, it doesn't change anything. Uh, the, it's still gonna uh, water just as normal. You just wouldn't get the fertilizer in it. And it's a great way to, to add and enhance your, your landscape by just doing something simple like this. So where do you buy stuff like that? From you know, we install this. These are uh, through the professional landscape companies will have these. This one's called Easy Flow. 
This one is the old version of them. Now the new ones, they uh, it's uh, instead of 1.5, it's 1.75, and it has two lids. So there's another lid here, and there's a ball valve on the outside of it. So when you go to uh, service it, you turn these off, okay? So there's no water going in it. And then you crack that ball valve, and then you can take off this lid, dump it out, fill it back up. You don't have to mess with any of this that has all these hoses onto it. So the new version of it, that they did that one, they made that change about a year and a half ago. Uh, but the new ones are really nice. They're easier to service. And a lot of times, you know, homeowners can service those too. But, you know, some people that we've installed them for, they'll just call us up. We have the big, uh, big containers of it and we can fill them up for people and check everything out and stuff. So that's the, that's, uh, that's it. And the last garden here is our, is our strawberry garden. And uh, we put the, uh, the lavender on top because it's beautiful, but it also brings in pollinators. Yeah. And, um, you know, but it brings in the pollinators that are gonna help all that uh, grow. Now, this is a very unique microclimate because again, it's under the house, under this large eave, but in really into December, all the leaves drop off this tree so it completely opens that up to the sun. Now during the summer, you know, here in a few months, it's gonna start leafing out. As it gets hotter, those are gonna be protected. So that microclimate, because of the, that tree, will change throughout the year too. That's been a fantastic spot for me to grow my strawberries. And out of all the gardens that I did for my dad, that seemed to be his favorite one. <laughs> so is that fertilizing? Everything. everything everything that the main thing is when you hook this up it has to be before any of the valves and you remember I told you guys when we were up front I put the valves closer to the point of use so the ones out on the street that valve box is right over there up against the fence uh, the ones at the gate that we're about to go through those are uh, there's a valve box right there so this is where the main water line is. You want to make sure you have this, which is a vacuum breaker. So none of the irrigation water can go back into the, to the house. Uh, so that is by code. You have to put those in. But then also I had mentioned too, I've got the hose bibs along the fence that are also hooked to the irrigation line. So anytime I use those garden hoses, those will have fertilizer in it. This one's connected to the house, so it's not, this is just the regular water. Uh, it's not hooked up to that. So that's why, I, and I just put it over here. I normally have that one over there because if we're doing plants and I'll move it here for, for that one if I want to add some extra or we're doing something different. But, um, you know, if you guys are interested in any of the stuff, uh, we are, uh, we had a, Justin was kind enough to invite us to the Home and Garden Show last weekend. Had a great time down there with them. Uh, we have an amazing promotion going on with our vertical gardens. It's about 30% off the garden. So if you would like to order one of the gardens, that, that promotion only goes on until tomorrow. Um, so if you need any of the fertilizer, you want to get some of these amazing uh, eggs that have the moringa in it and everything. We have those up there and some of the plants and stuff. So any of that stuff that you may want or need, it would we'd appreciate it. Cool. Did you got any questions? Yes. Yes. <laughs> Your hands. So you don't put any straw or anything in there. They just like lay on something flat and low. With okay, in the nesting box. That's one of the only things in that whole chicken coop that wasn't sort of salvaged. The, the big post, they redid telephone post uh, here. So I asked the guys, hey, can I get these? These pieces here, these big ones, those are the cross beams for the wires up there that they changed out. Um, and then, you know, I bought the wire, the, the roofing on this, a guy around the corner, um, he had a, a gate made out of that and he had a new gate made that was out for the trash to pick up. Like that's perfect. But that nesting box, I think if you Google best nesting box, that company I believe is out of Kansas and they make them in different sizes. This is a medium and it accommodates up to, up to like 30 hens, okay? Or 25, something like that. Um, 
and the material that they lay on it's a plastic material and it has holes in it because they scratch even in that area so if they do happen to poop on that it eventually it's going to dry out they'll be up there scratching and it'll just fall right through when you walk by there and you open up that lid it's just wire so once the hen gets up it's on an angle so once the head get, hen gets up that egg's just going to roll out uh, so when the next one gets in there and they move around if it didn't roll out if they move it around a bit it's going to roll out into the nesting box and so then we're harvesting clean eggs because she does she look like a girl that's going to go on a dirty egg, <laughs> pick up dirty eggs no but this way she does it how big is the coop it's about um seven by about 20 uh, so I don't know how many square feet that is. Now that is telling you right there, that's one of the hens that may have just laid an egg. And they will occasionally lay eggs inside there on the ground. And those are the ones that are treats for the dogs. Typically I'll just drop it on the ground and the dogs will lap it up and eat the shell and all as a treat. Yeah, they, they make that noise. Uh, they're sort of proud of what they've done, I think. And uh, with, the, with the hens, what I do is about two, three hours before sunset, so it changes through the year, I will open up the gate and they'll rush out and they'll go through the yard. They'll scratch in the compost area and here and around there. They'll get their bugs and all that kind of stuff. Um, and then when, the, when it gets to sunset, they automatically go back in because they want to be protected. They've got the roosting bars in there. And even with the roosting bars, you want to have it at a certain angle and separated so they're not above one another because that's when they poop a lot at when they're on the roosting bars and you don't want to poop it on their neighbor below them. So you want to calculate all that kind of stuff. And you know, you put a little bit more effort into something like this or your landscape, your irrigation, understanding your microclimate, you put a little bit more um, emphasis on that on the front end. And for the long haul, it just makes it so much more enjoyable to do your gardening and your growing. And that's what I think is so great about, you know, working this with agriscaping, because that's how I learned all this through Justin and helped me develop this and understand microclimate. So what's your next project? What's my next project? Well, we've got uh, some school gardens that we're doing and some that we're, we've got a, a big school garden that we're, that they've had our garden since like 2017 that we're gonna be refurbishing, doing the oil on them, upgrading some things. Uh, we've got some other commercial projects going on. We just finished our website, uh, you know, that took so much longer than it should have, but we, that was launched a few weeks ago. So uh, that's where we're at. And then there's always things around here to do. But the next big project is the sewer line out to the street. That's uh, Thursday, Friday here. Uh, so I don't know if you guys own your home and it's an older home. If you guys are in Phoenix, but they might do this in other cities. Yvonne, about eight years ago, noticed this on our water bill. There was an insurance thing that you could get for your water line and for your sewer line. They're separate. When we bought the house, the water line was new, all copper. So I was like, yeah, I don't need that. I knew this was old. So we've had that for about eight years now. And it's like $10 a month, pays up to $8,500. And this is gonna end up costing us $177 because of that. So if you guys might have a concern about it, I would definitely, definitely do that and uh, it's called service line warranty mm -hmm. yeah. and um, so the city they had to do their stuff out there uh, and they told me that a lot of if you're in like Peoria Glendale other parts of the valley the homeowner has to pay for that mm -hmm. Phoenix they take care of all that so we were really lucky because that would have probably been another thirty forty thousand dollars right there but, $4 million, what a mess. Oh my gosh. Yeah, yeah so hopefully this will go pretty smooth, but they've got things marked off and uh, and that's why I don't have much supplies over there because it goes right over where, you know, my shop is, where all the wood is and stuff, mm -hmm. so. So are they gonna dig all this up? No, what they're gonna do is they're gonna do holes. They're gonna do like three holes, maybe four, and then they can grab the line and pull it through to the next section 
and so they won't have to trench the whole way. Uh, so 